As you open your Bibles back to Hebrews chapter 2, a question that I lay before you, one I have con given serious consideration to over the past 15 years of ministry, is why have Baptists either minimized or misunderstood the significance of the ascension of Christ? I think of four major events that should be on the church calendar. Two of them we rightfully emphasize, but two scarcely. The two that we rightfully emphasize are the incarnation. And that's what you refer to in layman's terms as Christmas. And the resurrection, which you call Easter. But when was the last time we recall celebrating Pentecost? And you say, Pastor, the name on the church sign said First Baptist Church. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm talking to you about this. And when was the last time that we celebrated the ascension of Christ? See, I'm the product of your investment. So as Southern Baptists, you give, and money then is forwarded to help underwrite the theological education of pastors. You may not have known this, but 50% of my tuition to earn three degrees at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, half of the tuition was paid by faithful men and women in Southern Baptist pews who give their tithes and offerings. So I stand here, not the only product of that, but one of several who received that blessing. And I'm mindful of what's been entrusted to me, a significant investment made, and I have a big responsibility. You should receive a return on your investment, but more than that, the Lord should receive a return on His investment. And I'm mindful that what I've been able to be the beneficiary of is 2,000 years of scholarship. And I think back to even the founding of this church, or we can go even farther back, to the faithful preachers who did not have the full blessing that the preachers of my generation did. Many of them, they had the Bible, and they didn't have theological books, they didn't have commentaries, they just had a copy of the Word of God. And they preached faithfully the gospel of Jesus Christ, and churches were being planted all over the south and all over the frontier. They were faithful at their calling. They were faithful to what they knew and what they had been taught. But like every generation, mine included, we've not reached the apex of theological inquiry and discussion. But like every other generation, there's still some things to learn or things to be refined. You say, are you trying to introduce some new doctrine today? No, I'm not trying to introduce any new doctrine. I never would try to introduce new doctrine because that would take me outside of the Scriptures. But what I do want to say is that I think that we need to be reminded that the Lord has blessed us to receive further education and additional training that we might come back and might think through these doctrines and ask the Lord, what do you have for us? Unfortunately, sometimes there's this expectation that, that once something was said because of the preacher or because of the relationship you have to him, then the matter settled. I came out of a group. I was saved as part of a denomination that you, you weren't allowed to have open inquiry. You weren't allowed to go and study the Scriptures. You were told certain doctrines. You were told to repeat them, and you were given text to validate them. That was, to step even a hair's breadth away from what they considered orthodoxy would make you either a liberal or potentially a heretic. You were not to question the commandments and doctrines of men as established by proof texts. If you were, you were considered to be liberal. You were considered to be outside the camp. You, you had to be precise, but precise in what you were taught was the truth. And in that, occasionally God sends men who remind us that the church needs to be awakened. Whether it's 
men like Augustine, Luther, or maybe even men like Felix Mons, who many of you don't know. But that's because the Presbyterians drowned him because he wouldn't baptize his babies. I know some of you have a Presbyterian background, and I won't invite you near our pool. But anyway, so whatever. <laughs> I know what y'all did to some Baptists back 1500s. I ain't swimming with y'all, okay? I'm just telling you. <laughs> But occasionally we have to, to stop and to be awakened to maybe a doctrine that was neglected. Or maybe there needs to be some healthy pushback over and against commandments and doctrines of men. And so what I'm saying here today is, is that we shouldn't expect our pastors who we invest in to be limited based on what someone else was said was settled doctrine. The scripture should determine settled doctrine. Not me, nor any other preacher or theologian. We must be like the Bereans. So we come to this text, Ephesians, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 2, and we should be awakened to the significance of the ascension. The book of Hebrews, everything's based on the fact that Christ ascended and is seated on his throne. Everything is, is contingent on that fact. In fact, none of this would make sense apart from that truth and that reality. And because we've neglected or misunderstood it or limited the ascension of Christ, we haven't been able to appreciate the depths and the riches and the truths of books like the book of Hebrews and, for frankly, the rest of the New Testament. I dare say it limits our understanding of the book that bears a name that we should understand it but it's become hyper-complex. Think about the word revelation means to unveil what was previously hidden. But yet, we find over and over and over again, the more that you read modern commentators, the more the truths become hidden. But yet, God intended for these matters to be made plain. So I lay before you this question, can you have a king without a kingdom? I mean, think about it. You say someone's a king, but he doesn't have a kingdom? You can't be a king without a kingdom. And what does the king said? He sits on a throne. We've already seen this declaration in verse 3 that Christ is a ruler who is a king who is sovereign. Verses 7 through 9 establish. That, I mean, the language is plain here, ladies and gentlemen. The language is so simple and so plain. Notice what he says, particularly in verse 8. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So we have a king who's on a throne, but yet he doesn't have a kingdom. Is his kingdom relegated simply to your heart? Is that what sort of king is being proclaimed in the book of Hebrews? Is that the king that they were proclaiming in the New Testament? Is that the king they heard about in the early church when they're waiting for the day of Pentecost after the ascension of Christ? They were looking for a king because they're asking, is now the time for you to establish the kingdom? Is now the time to restore the kingdom to Israel is what they're asking them? And of course he tells them to go and to be witnesses, not to be consumed with times and seasons. That's a fresh word for us today. But to go out and to be his witnesses all over the earth, spreading the kingdom, what he preached about for 40 days, but the kingdom. What we find is we have a king who has a kingdom. He's seated upon his throne. He's not waiting for a kingdom. He has a kingdom. And that kingdom has been, been proclaimed since we find Jesus beginning his ministry. Simple reading of the text will make it plain. So when we come to chapter 2, verse 5, we ask ourselves, what would be the signs that the kingdoms come? Of course, today the way we do signs is totally different than the way we find it, the idea being used in the New Testament. Today what we do is we pick an event, and then we ascribe to it the value of a sign, as if we're prophets. We say, that's a sign. And then we go in reverse, and we try to justify our claim that it's a sign by Scripture. What we find here is that God clearly testifies to his message in signs, they're indisputable. These aren't signs that we need proof texting. Notice in verse 4, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. The author wants us to understand that the kingdom has come and the evidence that it's come is the evidence of the signs that would accompany the new covenant. The new covenant is not an interruption. It's not a halftime show. It's not a parenthetical. In fact, when we look at the language here in verse 5, we'll see that. 
For it was not to the angels that God subjected the world to come. Let us stop there. Now many have speculated because of a reference in Daniel chapter 10 or Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 that prior to the establishment of Christ's kingdom in his uh, incarnation, the inauguration of his kingdom, prior to that, that angels administered over the nations. And some have gone too far today claiming that there's an angel over each nation and there's certain boundaries marked out by that. But it's a strange reading, especially here because he says it's not to angels that he subjected the world to come. So some have speculated. We recognize that Paul and the apostles understood the angels to be administrating God's will, carrying out God's will. And what we find the author here saying is that time has come to pass. Now, of course, the struggle is when we read the Bible in English. And like the old preachers used to say, if it says all, it means all. The problem is, is that they didn't write the Bible in English. And so I'm not sure that we can use that ruler. When it says world, it means world. That's funny. He uses three different words for world in the New Testament. Which one are you talking about? Well, when he says he love, he means love. Well, there's at least three, maybe more, words used for love. So we must do the hard work of analyzing the Scripture. And so you've invested in me to do that work, and you continue to ensure that I'm able to focus on this work that I can come and hopefully, by God's grace, faithfully impart the truth to you. But there's a phrase here that may cause us to run amok, and that is the world to come. Now, there's two main words here, and the first one let's look at is world. That's not the word cosmos. We'd expect that from like cosmology. But this word here is never used of heaven. Never used of heaven. So we know that's off the table. So it's not talking about some sort of heavenly kingdom. Also, the world isn't talking about, if you will, the universe the way cosmos is. In fact, we find this word used in the Old Testament, that is the Greek translation known as the Septuagint, we find in Psalm 93 verse 1, and Psalm 95, verse 10, we've already seen the author's dependency on the psalm of this concept. It carries with it the idea of a kingdom of people, of an inhabited space. So it doesn't carry the idea of the cosmos, the universe, but the idea of an inhabited space. You see the way it's used in the, in the psalms. It is used of nations inhabiting a space. So when you, when you understand what he's saying here, he's not referring to heaven. And the second word is going to help us understand the timing. I think it's interesting because the apostles give us very clear uh, announcements of timing, but apparently they were always wrong on all their timing issues, but apparently we are always right on timing issues. I, I find that to be so peculiar, so strange, that we would think they need help on timing issues. They don't need any help on timing issues. They made a matter plain. They will say things like, well, they couldn't really see or couldn't really understand, but we do today, apparently. So you mean to tell me that I understand better than an apostle who wrote under divine inspiration? Absolutely not. In fact, I'm investing my life to study what they wrote. It would be the height of arrogance when, when they give us timing indications that I somehow know better the timing than they did. It is the height of arrogance for us as Christians to suppose that we know better than the apostles. But what we ought to do is generation after generation after generation try to gain, gain a better, more particular, more specific understanding of what they're saying. This world to come is followed by a second phrase. And that phrase to come gives us the idea of it's as a speculation, as if it's uncertain, we don't know. But actually that's not how the word would be used. The word would be understood as something that is intended by God to about or literally, we might say it like this, that it is at the point of happening, at the point of unfolding, literally or on the threshold, on the precipice of it breaking out. This word is never used to denote time outside of one's own generation. The author is using this specific word, these specific phrases, referring to a kingdom of citizens, a kingdom that is on the threshold. Now, 
You say, well, I see that he says subjected to the world to come. This just sounds like it's future. He's quoting the book of Psalms. And so for the psalmist, this would have been future. Understand, he's going back and doing an exposition of the Old Testament and specifically of the book of Psalms so that we would understand what we've inherited, what we have, what we are in, what we should celebrate. See, I don't know about you, but there's a couple things I'm tired of. I'm tired of all of the complaining. I mean, listen, we can continue to complain and complain and complain. It isn't getting us anywhere as Christians, and it doesn't advance the kingdom of Christ. That's one thing. And the second thing is I'm just fed up. I don't know about you, but I've absolutely had all I could take of this anti-gospel, anti-Christ government that continues to tell us that they've got our best interests, that they're for the working man, that they're for the Christian man. And then I see a horde of Satan tainic worshipers outside of our White House, listen, waving flags and carrying on with demonic sayings, and we hear crickets. Oh, I don't, it's whatever. I don't, I don't know. But sometimes you just got to say, I've had enough. And along with that, I've had enough of the doom and gloom and pessimism. What we need to do is to recognize what we've inherited, who we serve. That will wake the church up. Maybe today is the day they celebrate 500 years from now. That the church woke up. That we said enough. That we are not your subjects, we're subjects of a king. This word subjected carries with it the idea of the establishment of an economy or in a system. That is that in Christ, a system was being established, a kingdom was being established that would cover the globe. Yet we sit back as if we're defeated, as if we're whipped. Well, we're not. We won't tolerate it. Let me say this too. Some of you here, you don't understand the tactics of the evil one. See, here's, here's the message that they have for you. Here's the message the evil one has for you. Christianity is okay as long as you keep it in the church house. Jesus is just all right with me, oh yeah, as long as you aren't preaching to Jesus who is the king. You all notice I got that little song in there for you. Some of you had a flashback to your dope smoking days. But anyway, thank God you got right with the Lord and got saved. And for those of you who hadn't quit those days, you need to get saved today. So we're just praising the Lord. We're praising the Lord. You get saved today. Now that I got your attention, and some of you are nervous, here's what they want you to do. They're going to they're pick from amongst us individuals, and they're going to demonize them. We expect it. I expect it. I expect it. There's no doubt in my mind. What they want to do is make you be afraid to be associated with people who take a stand. That's the tactic of the evil one. They want, they're going to try to make it to where you feel uncomfortable. You'll say things like, well, i got to take care of my family. Well, we got, I don't want to lose my job. And then what they do is they divide us. And I'm going to tell you, the evil one is about dividing kingdom citizens. He's the one about dividing us. What we find here is clear language of uniting us, uniting us under one banner. That is the banner of Jesus Christ, and the banner is his kingdom. And when we think about this word, and the root word here, and I seldom give you Greek words, but I want to give you this one. The Greek root here for to come is the word mellow. Now, this word carries with it the idea of at the point of happening, on the threshold, at the moment. In other words, it's as if the air that you were expecting to come along as the window open, it's hitting you in the face. It's the very moment that you're breathing in the first freshness of that air as it unfolds around your face. It carries with it this idea that the kingdom has come. This is the message that Christ has preached. The kingdom has come. How else can you explain that the nations for 2,000 years have been coming to Christ? You say, well, it doesn't look that way today. That is because you are listening to the wrong people. 
I've said it before. They estimate approximately 50,000 new believers being baptized every day around the world. Great movements of God happening in Iran right now. Some of you, listen, some of you bought into politics so bad that you're talking about, well, we need to just bomb Iran out of existence. But you don't understand. Listen, I understand there's some evil leadership. But what you don't understand is there's a great movement of God in Iran. Some of you are talking about, well, China's our enemy. Well, I understand the Chinese communists may be the enemy of freedom. But let me tell you something. There's more Christians in China than there are people in the United States. Stop getting your talking points from politicians who are enriching themselves through your buying into the things they're selling. Instead, why don't we take a stand and demand that they articulate better points? Listen, you say, you don't ever get off of this thing. That's because you won't stop listening to them. I got to offer a counterpoint every Sunday to get you back to God's Word. You're buying into everything they're selling. What we need to do is demand of them that they hold to the truth that Christ is king, period, and his kingdom be advanced. Some of you come here on Sunday, you just need a reminder. You need to be encouraged. You say, I need to be encouraged. Well, let me encourage you with this, that Jesus said he'll never leave you nor forsake you, that he's with you always, low even to the end of the world. He's still the king. He's seated on the throne. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's not a king. He's not just my king. He is the king. All others are imposters. Listen, surrender your life. Submit your life to him. You say, you don't know what's going on in my life, but I serve a king who does. Therefore, I can, I, can, I can go through every day whatever trial or tribulation I'm facing because I recognize as a servant of the king, this is carrying out his will and carrying out his will for my life and advancing his kingdom. Therefore, I can move forward with great confidence. So he's establishing a kingdom. He says it's been testified somewhere. It's funny, it's as if you get this idea, he has no idea what he's talking about. Like he's just randomly choosing verses from all over the place, but that's actually not what happens. Is The point is he's not focused on the human author, but the divine author as he's letting Scripture speak. Notice he never says it, it is written. He says it says, it speaks, because he wants you to hear the divine voice through Scripture, quoting Psalm chapter 8. I want you to make a note for those of you who are study nerds who like this sort of things. Psalm 8 and Psalm 110 are in the New Testament always together, not maybe right next to each other, but when they're quoted, they're quoted in relation to each other. We just dealt with Psalm 110, and Christ being our high priest, the nations will be given to him. Psalm 8 is where he's quoting now. Notice the quote here that he gives us. Three aspects of the original creation, what God intended, what God's design was for humanity. Look at it in the second part of verse 6 through 8. Let's look together there. What is man that you're mindful of him? Let me hit pause. What you have here is this is the psalmist giving you divine commentary on Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when he says that he gave man dominion. That dominion was forfeited through the fall, through sin, through rebellion. Psalm 8 looks back and says, here was God's design. Three things, look at it. What is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. Here's the first. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. We remember God tells Adam he's to have dominion, and the dominion was to be over all of creation. Then we get to the end of chapter 2 of Genesis, and we hear that they were naked. And that same word, naked, is the word used in Genesis 3.1 of the serpent who's subtle, of the subtleness. It's a play on words. It's the idea is that from within the creation, now whether you believe that Satan took on the form of a serpent or Satan as a seraph, particular type of angel that was always, uh, the images were always that of like a serpent. Now certainly it is Satan there regardless, but either interpretation is legitimate. So from amongst the creation that they would have dominion over, they yield their dominion and are subjected to the results of the fall ever since. So here we have this idea that we're supposed to be more than conquerors. We're supposed to subdue creation. Now, in some respects, we still are. We're subduing creation. In fact, if you think about medicine, what is medicine? You're like, well, it's, it's a pill doc the doctor gives me. Okay, I, I understand that. But that pill, where'd that come from? What, 
It's not like they, they brought it in from outer space, okay? It comes from nature. We've discovered through, through having dominion over, we've discovered this isn't a real plant, so it can't become medicine. But anyway, through like plants and different things that we can make medicine, through studying the body and studying creation, we're claiming dominion. And we continue. Every time they find a cure for something, that is us claiming dominion. That's what that is. You're like, well, that's a scientist. What, do you have two religions? Are they a high priest of your other religion? Is that what this is? Because those scientists were created in the image of God. They're image bearers. We have the ability to think rationally and to discover. And in discovering, being able to apply principles and truths based on constants and being able to measure them and see that and then apply it to your life. That's what dominion looks like. Not the only place. There was a time that constitutions were written with very clear declarations of the sovereignty of God and the kingship of Jesus Christ. Many of you have been taught that, well, this nation was founded, it was founded with no religion. Now, there were 13 nations that joined together to, to assemble as one federal government, to unite under one federal banner. And those constitutions already established that those were 13 independent Christian nations. They gathered together, and when they decided that, that the nation, that is Congress, would not respect religion, it was to show that they weren't going to adopt any one particular Christian denomination to be the governing denomination of 13 independent nations that had gathered as one. Sounds like some of us need to go back to history lessons, go back to school. You say, we don't see everything in subjection to us. We see us in subjection to sin. Well, here comes the good news. Because one had to come and represent us. And he had to represent us in every way. That's this great transition in verse 9. Excuse me, second half, verse 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. And I think this transition here carries with it this idea that there's, a, there's the direct interpretation that this was applying to Adam and humanity. But as we look through Hebrews and we see how the author is applying it, that Christ is the fulfillment of it. So while Psalm 8 looks back to Adam and recognizes his shortcomings, it looks forward to, to the Son of Man. Even in the quotation, it carries with it this idea that there's the ideal that the ideal is coming. And we see in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, that the Son of Man was given the kingdom at his ascension. The Son of Man here being a reference to humanity, but then applied to Christ. But notice what he says here. He's going to show us that two of the three things are obvious and visible to us, but yet there's one that's not visible. And that one that's not visible, we can trust that it's true based on the two that are. Now, I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. Now, remember, I told you on the one hand, yes, this is a reference to Adam, but we're seeing the transition to Jesus being the ideal. And some say, well, I don't see everything in subjection to Jesus. I don't see everything in subjection to him. Then why in the world are you praying to him? Oh, if he's not sovereign over everything, then why would you pray to him? Amen. I pray to him because he is sovereign over everything. He's the one who moves mountains. And sometimes when you're praying the mountain to be moved, you need to pick up a shovel and by faith start digging. Some of you want to stand over here like, well, this is faith. I'm going to tell that mountain to be moved. I'm just going to keep you on at the mountain. Well, what it takes is faith to believe that God said that mountain will be moved, but maybe he's given you the energy, strength, and resources, church, to move the mountain. Amen. Does it take no less faith to stand there and say, oh, Faith, mountain be moved. I'll tell you what I'll take. I'll take a thousand people with shovels in their hands saying, we're going to believe by faith that that mountain's going to be moved because God is sovereign. He'll give us the strength and resources to move that mountain. So notice, though, the first two things that you do see. And I like this transition. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. But we see him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Don't minimize that. Like, well, that's just Christmas. That's just the incarnation. Are you serious? God took upon himself human flesh to represent us, to reclaim everything that was lost? Oh, no, that's no minor thing. In fact, that is the most significant thing in human history. We dare say that when God said, us make man in our image, this was already his plan. It was already his plan. 
This isn't a plan B. It's not a reaction. It's not a parenthetical. It was always his plan. And so do you trust in the incarnation of Christ? Were you there? Were you at the manger? I already know the answer. <laughs> of course not. You know. Like, but, I, but I have a set. I set it up in my house every year. Right? We put it in the yard. We always put the wise men in the wrong place too, preacher. We always have them right there. Are you like, you're getting started on that already, preacher's name, Thanksgiving, and you're already on my wise man and my nativity set. Well, I'm just trying to get you started before you put it out. Well, no, we weren't there, but how do we believe in the incarnation? How do you believe in the incarnation? You believe by faith. The right witness is testifying to that. You believe. Notice what it says, the second thing, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. This is pointing to his resurrection, pointing to his, his death on the cross. Were you at the cross? No. But we believe by faith. Do you have absolute empirical certainty that when he was on that cross that he bore the debt for your sins? You don't have that sort of empirical certainty, but what you have is faith, and you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God became man, dwelt among us, hung on that cross, and took our sin debt in full. You say, well, I'm looking around, I don't see it. What do you mean you don't see it? You're living it right now. You're breathing it. You are living according to those truths. Therefore, we can by faith live with the belief that he is receiving the nations as his inheritance and that everything is subjected to him. Why in the world are we praying for these shoeboxes, praying for lost people? Why if it's not all subjected to him? Why do we pray things like this? Lord, send somebody Anybody who knows you to my loved ones, that they might hear the gospel. Lord, do something with these shoe boxes in a village, in a nation. I don't know where that box is going, but I know I serve a God who does. And he already knows everybody in that village. And he intends for that box to send revival and the gospel to that village. Why don't we believe those things by faith? Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm not even finished. I want you to see something beautiful, though, because I think we saved the best for last. Look at, look at the very last verse in our section here today, verse 9. But see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. I praise the Lord. Some say this with everyone means without exception. I think you missed the point. I think it's better said without distinction. It means everyone without distinction. That's more powerful. That's more powerful than anything that Pelagius could have ever preached. Everyone without distinction is the emphasis. Not without exception, without distinction. That means that the man-made barriers have no power. The stratum in which we delegate to people in society, we say you're part of this class or that class, have no power. Nationality, ethnicity, race, and color have no power and bearing when it comes to the atoning work of Christ. His death was made for us without distinction. But this word taste, some have speculated over the years of the significance of this word. One of the early church fathers said that it was like Jesus was a physician. And you know, physicians, they give you medicine. They don't taste it, though. I've never had a physician take some of the medicine like in front of me and then give it to me. We should, you know what? Make a note of that. <laughs> I'm just saying, next time you want me to get a shot, yeah. Yeah, you're going to take one in front of me. Okay, anyway, so that, I could come up with these things. That was great. So, <laughs> so he, he says it's like a, like a physician who taste the medicine before he gives it to you. But I don't think that's it. I think that's a noble attempt. Uh, the word actually means experienced. 
It means experience. And so the idea of experience, if I say something, you experience, you got to experience something. Like, you, you know, you, gotta, you taste it, right? You, taste is a very sensitive part of our experience, right? There's some things you, you taste, you're like, whoa, I don't like that taste. Or there's a taste that's good. You understand that. So, for example, I'll just give you, let's just help you with this. I need you to understand this Greek word, so i got to give you something in your context. For example, in the South, the more sugar you put in the tea, the better it allegedly tastes. Amen? Some of you, yes. So you, you understand taste, right? Right? It's just there's a certain taste you experience. it. You get a little experience of the South with that taste. So the, the translators here are trying to help us understand that it wasn't like he, he just sampled, but it was to experience in the full way. And I want you to understand, because we, we talk about Jesus experiencing death. And in a few verses, he's going to talk about how we are universally afraid of death. We fear death. It's part of, the, part of the fall that we now fear death. But I want to help you with something. You will never... I'm not talking about whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian. Listen to me. Humanity will never experience the full effects of death. Now, hold on. First of all, as a Christian, obviously you will not. But even the unbeliever will not experience, listen to me, the full and total effect of death. Whoa, wait a minute. Where is he going with this? Now I've got your attention. Some of you are up on the edge of your seat. You're ready to text some friends like, he's about to drop heresy up in here. Record this. You're secretly recording it right now because you're terrified. Listen to me. The only one who could have ever fully and completely experienced death would be one who was perfect. You from a state of under condemnation already to death is horrendous and horrific and unimaginable. But imagine this. Can you imagine one who's undeserving of death, one who's perfect and pristine and pure and holy in every single way? No one in history has ever experienced death to the capacity and to the extent that Jesus Christ experienced it. And when we recognize these truths, we'll stop minimizing the gospel, stop watering it down, and start preaching a high Christology because I want you to understand, well, yes, your friend may have given their life for you or somebody would give their life for their family members. The life that Jesus gave was unmatched. Therefore, his experience was unparalleled. Let that settle in for just a moment. Christ in his sinful, in his, excuse me, in his sinless perfection realized the awfulness of death like no one could ever have realized it. Thus, there's an immeasurable difference between his death and the death of any other person. Therefore, he stands alone. In his exaltation, some have asked the question, could Jesus have sinned? And the answer is absolutely, in his humanity, he could have sinned. He learned obedience through suffering, and as a human being, he chose to obediently surrender and submit to God's will in every respect. Why? Because you and I won't and can't in our sinful flesh. So he experiences, like no one in human history, the effects of death so that you never would have to. There is no king like Christ. All others are imposters. Christ has brought his kingdom to his people, and you say, Pastor, I'm looking, and I'm going to give you this. Do you watch a tree grow? I'm certain that you stand in your yard every day watching your tree grow. No, you don't, because you're not mad or insane. You ever had that moment, though, you planted a tree? Jamie and I experienced this. 
and it looked like it was going to die. I'm, I'm surprised that it made it. And we lived there for about five years, four years, and we moved away, and we came back 20 years later. And that same tree, you couldn't see the front of the house. It's amazing. It's about perspective. If you think you're going to watch a tree grow in a few days, that isn't how this works. See, but the smallest seed, the kingdom is like the smallest seed was planted, becoming one of the biggest trees. The kingdom continues to grow. The kingdom continues to grow. It's all about your perspective. It's all a matter of perspective. And here's the perspective the author of Hebrews wants us to have, that Jesus Christ experienced on, on our behalf as our representative something that we could never have fully experienced to that fullest extent because we were sinners. But the even better news is this. He experienced it so that we would never have to. When do we have eternal life, church? We have it right now in Jesus Christ. Let us, therefore, live that way. Let us pray.